So we want to uh, talk to you basically about collaboration, uh, interaction uh, between humans, businesses, SMEs, and enterprises focused to really accelerate the transition towards the circular economy. And not just in any way, but in a way that creates benefits uh, to all. So, um, dear panelists, I would like to make this an, uh, an, an interactive uh, session. So basically start a conversation about this topic uh, instead of just asking uh, questions. But before we start, I think it's good that we uh, introduce uh, the panelists first. So for those of you that, that don't know me, my name is uh, Roy Verkoele. I'm the co-founder of Circular IQ. We've created a web-based platform that allows companies to measure circularity uh, inside their company, but also in their supply chain and work towards collecting information um, across certification programs that are relevant to them and work on improving confidentiality um, uh, of that information um, as well. So I'll give uh, the word to you, Max, if you can uh, introduce yourself. If I may, I would say ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a microphone? Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, you know me because you've just heard enough from me. My name is Catherine Jose, um, and I lead the Circular Economy program at the UK's Knowledge Transfer Network, which helps connect SMEs and large corporates and universities and anyone else in the innovation ecosystem to take ideas to market. And again, I'm Kate Daly and I'm with New York City's Center for Urban Innovation and we promote resilient, diverse, sustainable and inclusive economic growth in New York City with our goal to create more jobs for New Yorkers. Yes, and I'm Per Orlando Norgard, and I'm a head of communication at Symbiosis Center Denmark. And basically, we're taking the learnings from the Kalambar Symbiosis and use them to uh, uh, creating more industrial symbiosis. And actually, we have a, a, a program called Residual to Resources, and that's focused on SMEs. And finally, this is Max, Max Delini. I'm the head of Secret Economy Project at Intesa San Paolo. Intesa San Paolo is the Italian bank behind Made in Italy, uh, among the strongest bank in Europe nowadays. Uh, the journey that we are enduring on Secret Economy started from a very simple, straightforward question, uh, starting from sustainability. Intesa San Paolo is among the best sustainable companies in the world by uh, awards and indexes. However, we did ask ourselves what does it mean for a financial institution to be so sustainable with perhaps not so sustainable clients? This is where the journey for circular economy started, and we uh, are a relationship-driven bank. Uh, we are a bank of the real economy. I do work with the Innovation Center of Intesa San Paolo. That's where we secure our role as financial service global partner of the Alamecato Foundation. So thanks for the invitation and let's engage in a productive conversation. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you all for introducing yourselves. Maybe to, um, to kick off with a, a, a general notion. I mean, today, right now, we have over 7 billion uh, people living on our planet. Uh, we have more technology than ever to connect with others. And yet it seems uh, that we are more and more disconnected of our neighbors and the people uh, surrounding us. So maybe to, to kick off, just to ask you, um, do you know of any examples where you see opportunities to really collaborate and connect with others in supply chains or in communities to really accelerate the transition towards uh, circular economy uh, models. Who wants to respond? I, I think I'll respond first just because the way that you framed the question sort of, it strikes me that, that these are moments that historically have repeated 
time and time again. So as industrialization took over starting in Britain, then we see the arts and crafts movement emerging in reaction to that as a more sort of human-centered design approach to the machine age that was upon us. And, I, and I've seen examples, and I, I'm sure everyone in the room has seen examples all over the world of the idea of repair and remanufacturing as being a very local community-based effort where that collaborative consumption and remanufacturing and, and sharing a power drill from, for example, Toronto's library of things is, is something that, that we're seeing emerging more and more. One case study that I, that I saw recently is, is the sort of the death of the shopping mall in the United States and the big box stores that are starting to close down as the, the shopping and e-commerce trends have overtaken the big box stores that overtook the mom and pop stores and, and really decimated the downtowns on many, many cities and towns in the United States and seeing that there is always inevitably a reaction to the mechanization and the industrialization that, that results in movements that are very ecosystem building and community facing. And the circular economy promotes great examples of that in terms of the repair and reuse ethos that, that we're starting to see very, very slowly emerging in communities. Thank you. Yeah, so we um, certainly are seeing this as an opportunity in the UK. In fact, it was quantified, the sharing economy, as a nine billion opportunity by a, a report commissioned by our, one of our government departments. And um, what's interesting in particular is that, that what you described and the desire to get to know your neighbours is not just a personal thing. Um, actually, there was a talk uh, and they're exhibiting uh, Peterborough City Council and they've got some quite interesting industrial areas which have a real kind of mishmash of different companies. Um, you know, big corporates sitting alongside tattoo parlors and um, even churches and all sort of strange mixture of companies in, in one industrial area. And, and what they found was that the companies there don't feel a sense of place, a sense of ownership and, and really want that. They actually want to know who their neighbors are, who they're sharing a business park are. So there's opportunities um, far beyond the sort of opportunity for the sharing economy to connect on the, be on the sort of peer-to-peer -peer consumer, you and I space. Businesses are actually seeing that as, as a way to reconnect because supply chains have gone so global that they just don't know if there's a printer who could supply them just down the road. They're probably mm -hmm. going, well, anywhere for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that's an an, an, an interesting point you're making uh, you're making there. That's maybe also about scope. So, what's the scope of addressing uh, a problem? Because in the end, um, by determining the scope of the problem, so your boundary conditions in thinking about solutions, that's uh, where a lot of r restriction is basically being generated. So, uh, maybe to 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 a next uh, topic. Can we maybe share with the with the room uh, ideas that uh, or examples that relate to really um, innovation strategies uh, on a system uh, on a system level? I would say it's a, a fantastic opportunity. Um, just one step back uh, from a financial institution, uh, I had the chance to anticipate this uh, in other sessions, but. Uh, um, before selling credit cards and home loans, we, as financial institutions, we do intermediate trust. I think that circular economy can be seen as a powerful tool in re sort of fostering cooperation thanks to trust in the value chain, in the supply chain, in the cooperation among the players uh, not just uh, uh, in a single industry, but cross industry. And from a financial perspective, I, I think that, of course, this is a great opportunity for us uh, in premis in terms of uh, um, the learning experience that we can do in reframing the concept of risk because we need to reframe the concept of opportunity. And uh, to give examples, I believe that, of course, uh, talking about uh, um, car sharing, for example, uh, many cities around the globe have been experiencing these kind of initiatives. And uh, all of a sudden, you realize how a single project has brought forward and together many different actors, starting, of course, from the planning of the city, uh, automakers, 
uh, IT companies, advertising companies, it's becoming uh, clear how cooperation is going to be uh, the winner kind of ingredient that uh, uh, the additional value uh, extraction can command. And to move uh, from such kind of, uh, I would say, established, kind of established um, example, I would move to real estate because it's, I would say, pretty similar. Uh, we know Philips Lighting is uh, uh, pursuing a, a strategy on circular economy with the model of paper use, paper light. Well, if you think about how you want to invest and how you do want to finance a real estate project, again, all of a sudden, you do have in front of yourself a sort of platform because you have a building company can design uh, modularity, can work in terms of circular real estate, then you have lighting companies, then you have carpeting companies, then you have IT companies, and so on. This is where cooperation is, uh, is flourishing. This is where risk mitigation is, because you have a comprehensive view. And this is what uh, uh, the uh, leadership of Ellen MacArthur and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation for us has been in uh, educating ourselves and helping ourselves, at least from the financial perspective, to have a much broader view, to have a, a sort of systemic approach to risk and to uh, return. So if I may, I would say that we are in an uh, interesting moment, of course, where uh, cooperation is the um, main uh, driver for new value creation in the sharing and the circular economy. And then maybe later we can go back to this, but I believe that benefit corporation, one of the tools that corporate governance is putting forward in the market, is one of the models that uh, entrepreneurs for success um, and of success in the future will adopt. Benefit Corporation is basically a very simple tool, voluntary tool, that companies can adopt. So if we look at circular economy from a macroeconomic perspective, we can say that the Benefit Corporation is much more a microeconomic level, and it's a tool where a company decides all over the world, globally, a co single company can decide to uh, put on their statute that they want to become a company able to produce an economic, environmental, and social benefit. It's a flourishing um, movement, started from the US, and we can go back to that. Sorry for being long. Actually, I want to, to ask a question. It strikes me. We have a saying in Kalomborg, where we have a Kalomborg symbiosis. We have a saying that goes, systems make it possible uh, people make it happen. And I have a, a, a story of this project we call from, resource, from residual to resource. And my question goes on, how do we connect this system to people? Well, I think of myself that I'm in the people business because we have a lot of SMEs in Denmark. And of course, it's easy for, for big companies to have a big result. but. Well, we have a lot of SMEs. We cannot copy the Kalambos symbiosis because we have not that many industrial areas. We have small and medium-sized enterprises. And some of them, one of them, was part of this project. And uh, I'll tell a story about this elder couple that runs a small dry uh, cleaning shop. And they had to close the shop completely a half day to take part in a workshop. And when I did an interview with them on the outcome, they promptly declared that it was it all worth taking the time, driving a long way, closing the shop, because they had an experience on that workshop where they uh, heard other SMEs' problem and they gave feedback to each other. And my point is, I think there's, there's an interest, but these elderly couple, they wouldn't understand a word of what we're talking about. But so how do we connect this system to the people? Yeah, excellent question. Would it, who, who likes to, to comment? I, I have the answer to that question. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> no one has the answer to that question, but I think it's a, it's a good question. It's, I think your, your original question of 
what is the, the solution to, to scale systemic change? That's the one trillion dollar circular economy question that, that everyone here is working towards in the sort of baby steps that are, that are feasible. I think in terms of your example of this elderly couple that, that does not use this language that, that we're using, um, for me, the, the sort of maker movement that, that we've seen internationally is one way to, to link people together, that, uh, that it's exposing people who are makers from different generations to new tools, and that many, many cities and municipalities are actively fostering programs to put those tools in the hands of young people in, um, to be more inclusive about giving access to those tools to marginalized populations. And so that's one small baby step of, of an effort to address that, that divide that you described. Maybe not for for the dry cleaners, but if we're talking with quite technology intensive businesses, a, a lot of the work we do is sometimes talking about these things to them in their own language. So if I'm talking to a chemicals company, I might ask them about the opportunities related to industrial biotechnology within, within their process. Or if I'm talking to a construction company, we might talk about whole life performance of buildings or off-site manufacturing. So I think it's right. Most people, you say circular economy and you'd get a complete blank look. Obviously, that's that we're getting there. The message is spreading. But, but generally, when in, in my role, we're talking to generally quite technology-led businesses. Often, you just strip out all this technology, all, all the terminology. We would never say restorative by design or regenerative or loops or inner loops or outer loops because they wouldn't, they wouldn't know what any of it was. But they, they do understand the trends within, within their sector and how they're impacting them. And that's where you can talk to them about, mm -hmm. um, you know, do you have certain materials that are, that are volatile in your supply chain? You know, do you have problems with waste? These are things that all people understand. Okay, thank you. No, from a, I would say, a even higher level perspective, from a theoretical standpoint, I would say that, of course, provocatively enough, we have a chance to um, rethink the separation that we ourselves put between being citizens and being customers. Because at the end of the day, when we do study accounting in universities, and as of today, 16th of November, we are still producing linear COs out of the best universities in the world. When we do teach the current way of accounting for ex negative externalities, we are creating a damage. But we have been doing so because we wanted to take the human mind and narrow the identity of the human being, focusing much more on marketing and uh, selfishness. We just don't need to re-engineer human being. We just need to go back to what human beings are, collectively and working together. And that's where I do personally believe finance has a great um, responsibility in trying to make sure that citizen and customers don't see uh, each other in a confrontational way because as citizens we are paying of course not the collateral damages of uh, a misunderstood uh, way of creating wellness but as customers we always want the best and we usually are not very well positioned to understand the negative externalities that such kind of behavior creates. Mm -hmm. So of course, it's still to be done, but it's more down to personal responsibility and is down to education. And that's where we at Intesa San Paolo are working hard to make sure that there is a master on circular economy and bioeconomy in Italy, because we believe that there is a, a purpose, there is a, 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 an opportunity, but more importantly, people can be re-engaged if they are seen, them, if they see themselves being part of the solution as a win-win yeah. kind of uh, uh, solution. It's not that something that you need to do, or like now, circular economy, European Commission initiative, down to citizens. 
is something that collectively we can guide because everybody has a role to play and the more collaborative and cooperative we become since the beginning, more win-win op- um, um, the situation could become at the end. Mm, interesting, interesting point. I think it also uh, relates back to what, what you were saying before, Catherine, about bringing the language also back to the people we engage with to make sure we have uh, meaningful uh, conversations with language uh, people understand. I mean, externalities uh, as such is, a, uh, is, is not a very difficult term, but um, I think if you ask your average consumer about uh, externalities, uh, you, you wouldn't get um, the, the answer you're, you're looking for when uh, I think there's a, there are a lot of opportunities to really make uh, the storytelling and the examples that we are uh, dealing with and hearing about here today, like, for example, Philips or Yesterday, uh, Park 2020 or Ecor uh, on stage uh, here before, these are interesting uh, products, interesting solutions, interesting ways and examples to think circular that really uh, translate in uh, totally different uh, measures and, and impacts. And maybe it's time to, to try and have a more educated conversation about the externalities of these types of innovations without addressing them as externalities. Anyone want to comment on that? I, I think that in terms of looking at one successful model where people have, as consumers and citizens, asked the question, where is this coming from, this thing that I'm buying, is food. I I really don't know of many other examples aside from food where people do ask that question Mm. as reflected in the multi-billion dollar organic food market that is a huge part of the, the economy in many areas. I think the second question is, where does this go after I'm done with it? And people are not asking that question. But that's where the emerging food waste movements and where regulatory and policy drivers can incentivize companies and citizens to start asking themselves both of those questions around sectors not just limited to food, which was largely driven in many cases from health concerns. Um, And if there's a way to extrapolate the lessons from that, I think that's a good start. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Well, a a similar question was asked. um, I'm losing track of days now, either today or yesterday, but you know, how much does the consumer need to to know? And uh, Wayne from Elwood, I don't know if he's still in the room, his answer was, uh, you know, do they need to know? And I think it it obviously depends on on the product, but in some cases, if you're just meeting a consumer need, giving them a service or a product that they want, and by making it better, easier, more convenient, more features, they choose it, fine. In some cases, like food, sure, people will ask questions, but where they're not asking questions, there's other ways to go about affecting the change rather than just through communications, because let's face it, people are busy, people um, are lazy, (laughs) I know I am, so it's difficult to make the right choices, there's too much information, and even when we get information, we don't understand it, So um, in some cases, it's helpful if the companies who can pay people to do an LCA and and, and actually understand what the right answer is can can help do the right thing and give customers the right products rather than putting it back to us always to have to make the choice. Mm. Okay, good. So uh, maybe to the, to the room as well, uh, feel free to ask um, any questions uh, you might have relating to this uh, panel discussion. Um, I'll look on that screen in, uh, in a minute, but also feel free to come towards the microphones and participate to, uh, to open it up a little. Okay, so um, maybe a question for you, uh, Pear. We, we heard you uh, speak about industrial uh, symbiosis. Um, uh, the, the panel before the panel before this panel. <laughs> Could you maybe uh, elaborate uh, a little on, uh, let's say, the position of industrial symbiosis related to uh, the circular economy and how industrial symbiosis could be used to generate uh, benefits 
uh, for um, everyone indulging in it? Yes, of course. <coughs> uh, well, as um, we see ourselves as a part of a circular economy when we're working on uh, creating more industrial symbiosis, and and but we are we are focused on this job, I would say. So we don't actually have the, the overview, uh, but we are quite focused on, on creating this industrial symbiosis. And it, 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 because it leads to uh, a reduced, uh, reduced use of resources and uh, it gets uh, a more competitive companies, uh, more resilient companies, and it also, uh, of course, uh, c makes cost reductions when you use uh, less resources and that also give less uh, emissions. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the industrial symbiosis, but basically it's it's like an, a principle from 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 the nature, uh, from mutual benefit uh, between different uh, species, and that's similar in in the business uh, world, where often we see the best results when we have different species between companies. Uh, so it's different branches, not direct competitors, and. Um, um, the, s the second part of your question was, sorry. Um, if you could get into, but I think you, you, you yeah. did so already, yeah. about the relationship between industrial symbiosis and the circular economy. So yes. Thank you, I yeah. think you addressed that. We have a, a question uh, from the audience about the role of the media in this uh, transition. So do we have any volunteer to answer that question? Max? <laughs> 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 Let's be brave. <laughs> no, um, I would go back to climate change because it's something that I did work on when I was in the US. Uh, I do uh, recall a professor at Yale University uh, helping the administration uh, of the time to uh, better frame the um, theme about uh, climate change. And the, and the example that he put forward was a sort of... Uh, uh, crystal clear. Climate change doesn't care whether you are Republican or Democrat. It will destroy your house in any case. This was a sort of powerful statement and then the US administration moved forward and the agenda on climate change had a, a, a great momentum uh, with uh, um, the administration. I believe circular economy, uh, again, uh, if we are able to um, represent this first of all as innovation rather than just sustainability, we would uh, serve ourselves a great kind of uh, uh, purpose because I believe globally there is great interest in trying to see how from this actual crisis we can come out. Of course would be sort of uh, not naive uh, uh, to think that circular economy is the answer, but circular economy could be one of the options for this topic. How you redefine growth, how you redefine value, how you redefine the opportunity to look at the economy as the engine for growth in a more constructive, natural, sort of collaborative way. So I believe that if we focus for a minute on the strategic agendas of countries, corporates, so on, all too much busy on pushing for growth. And we do step back and we do together understand how that sort of intended growth could be changed in something which is going to create value, which is actually about circular economy. There where you get the numbers from McKinsey, from Accenture, from other consultancies, and that's where the World Economic Forum is putting all its effort from January 2017. There will be a major initiative at the World Economic Forum level, and this is helping global leaders to put circular economy top on the agenda. I believe, again, in terms of media, in terms of education, don't talk about sustainability, because again, provocatively enough, I would try to say Sustainability is a great thing. But I believe we could also see sustainability as one of the major um, efforts successful in trying to mitigate 
the negative externalities, the negative consequences of the linear model, a model which is basically fundamentally flawed. Circular economy is, I would say, one step further. It's already a sustainable model, for sure, by something more. That's why if I think we can use the concept of innovation for circular economy, where there are five new business models, at least, to be enhanced, where there is new way of cooperating, where there is new way of understanding how you do create value, how you do interact within the value chain, think about Industry 4.0 is something which is incredibly important and is still confined only to the industrial world. Circular economy is social innovation. I believe that from the media standpoint, if we detach a little bit from the sustainability framework and we do push forward for business and for growth, for pro-business kind of argument, everybody would have some different op options and opinions, but at least we are all on the same page in saying that it's time to turn the page on how we do create value and how we do boost our economies. So I logged on to the BBC website last week, and uh, what was the number one article? Not the election of Donald Trump, not anything to do with the latest wrangling in the courts about Brexit. Um, it was all about Toblerone. So uh, any UK people will no doubt be familiar with this story. Toblerone changed uh, the design of of the actual chocolate bar, so they basically removed one triangle. So you had this triangle, big space triangle. It caused a media furor. So what's the point of this? Well, the brands are terrified of the media, mm -hmm. and that can be a positive thing and it can be a negative thing, depending mm -hmm. depending on what the media finds. But but honestly, the fuss over Toblerone, it was it was quite it was quite amazing, and um, it it's a lesson. I'm organizing a conference next week, and I've got a number of big brands speaking. And the first question I was asked by most of them was, will there be any media in the room? Mm. So it's in, especially in the run-up to Christmas, it gets even, even more sensitive for, for particularly the fashion and the, the retail brands. So yeah, the media play a big role, but sometimes not in the way you might expect. You, couldn't, you could not have predicted the Toblerone scandal we had in the UK last week. It was good fun. And I'll just add briefly that, that with the media, what we all see is that they want novelty. And so the, the good news story is not enough of a hook. There has to be some aspect of ne negativity, but not, not the despairing negativity of, of climate change. And so I think that, that within each of these sectors that we're working in, you know, looking for that hook that provides the novelty for the media without it being too much of a downer. And also that I, I totally agree that leading with sustainability is is not something that from the economic development perspective that that I would typically be able to do because what I want to lead with is that there are concrete jobs being generated from these new innovations and business models and that's a, that's a story that communities want to hear whether or not the media cares to share it um, and so that would always be my first impulse in terms of telling the story of what we're all trying to do okay good then uh, maybe that's uh, a, a, a good opportunity to go to the next uh, question from the from the audience, which is, if um, there's a calculation of the the true value, the socio-economic and environmental impact of uh, the acceleration that uh, institutions have to make in this field. I think we're all familiar with the uh, Alan MacArthur reports, but this question is um, specifically related to true value. So I don't know if any of you have experience with that and want to respond to it. I mean, from my personal kind of experience, I think that uh, uh, True Cost put forward a report, I think it was 2011 something, where the, the, the staggering figure was that the, the 3,000 top listed companies around the world created 2.8 trillion of uh, negative externalities just to, again, trying to understand what opportunities are and what the consequences of doing some of the opportunities in some way could create. And uh, from a more personal perspective, I would say that uh, uh, Puma, for example, a company of uh, Kering Group, in 2010, they developed the environmental PNL. Again, 
nothing staggering, not rocket science, just transparency. And again, trust. Mm -hmm. And Puma in 2010 made an excellent exercise from my standpoint, of course. Uh, they tried to measure the negative impact that their supply chain uh, was having across the globe. And they labeled one, two, two, four, uh, one with being the minimum impact, negative impact, environmental and social, and fourth being the best, the, the, the highest, so the worst kind of result. And uh, surprisingly, not, not, not really surprisingly for them, they discovered that number four was in Australia, where do they raise uh, cattle and they have the cows for where, uh, from where the, 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 the leather for shoes is, is made. Uh, Puma did something astonishing. They put uh, um, black on white on the report that for that year, 50%, 50% of their net profit was due to nature. I'm not sure whether this is already circular because, of course, it is something that was, I would say, responsible kind of accounting, but in a nutshell, would have given mm, sort of inspiration to try to better understand what we really do use and what we do really do when we do create opportunities and value. And in 2015, the holding group, caring group, adopted the environmental PNL exercise at group level. This is leadership. From my side, what they did was to recognize through cost, true value, what's actually going into the product and what and how much we are ready, we as companies, as investors, as uh, financiers, how much are we ready to recognize in this exercise? Because again, if we want risks and we want opportunities, we need to balance them. And sometimes we do forget about the negative aspects of uh, uh, pursuing just opportunities. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, if, if no one else would like to comment on that, then uh, maybe move towards the next question from the audience, which is about the millennials, uh, generation, uh, the new generations, generation X and Y. Do any of you have thoughts and ideas on how to engage these new generations that are, let's say, very well uh, socially connected and to use their energy and creativity to speed up the transition towards more circular systems? Would like to. No volunteers. Uh, yeah, well. I, I talk about millennials all the time, but usually okay. behind closed doors. Okay. Um, well, this, the door is closed. Close the door. <laughs> so you you conflated Gen X and Gen Y. Mm -hmm. I, as a Gen Xer, I don't think of myself as a millennial, so I'll draw that line. But mm -hmm. I think that you're absolutely right. It's the connectivity, the use of social media that that are driving those forces. I think that that a lot of millennials in the United States got a wake-up call last week that tweeting your opinion does not equate taking action in your community or, or sort of making a difference in terms of affecting social change. And so I think that, that in many ways, the, the social media platforms that that generation is so dependent upon don't always serve, as we all might agree, that kind of cohesive community building um, goal that, that I think people might think is happening when they're using those platforms. But I think that the fact that there is that connectivity and that a message can be shared so quickly can absolutely be used to our advantage. And also the fact that one striking uh, feature that's been documented about the millennial generation is that they're very mission driven in terms of the types of employment that they want to have. That, that in their jobs, they want to have meaning in their jobs. And if there's not meaning, that they will they will vote with their feet in terms of leaving. And as employers, that's something that we have to deal with as, as talent retention. And I think that that's an attribute that we really could tap into in terms of sending out the message of something as weighty a topic as this. Good point. I totally, do you want to add? I totally support uh, and I want to build on uh, Kate's um, answer because uh, what I was referring to in the beginning, which is the benefit corporation, is exactly the kind of companies for uh, which uh, millennials do want to work for. Those are companies, I mean, just to name one, Patagonia, I think most of us know Patagonia. 
Patagonia is not just a, a, a brilliant kind of uh, um, organization, but it's a benefit corporation. And the CEO of Patagonia declared that the company could grow much faster than what they do actually. But he doesn't want to. Because if he does, the company could gain, investors could gain, but the global community would lose from the environmental and social perspective. He is an entrepreneur who is inspiring a new generation of workers, co-workers, entrepreneurs. And there are other 3,000 and some companies like those around the globe. I think that uh, exactly, as Kate was saying, uh, a meaning, a purpose, and again, transparency and trust, how you can contribute to a successful story in your life, changing world, changing uh, country, changing uh, um, work, changing habits. But this is where they do find um, purpose, and I do believe that is a great kind. I, I want to just uh, share a very quick uh, uh, kind of picture. Uh, in Amsterdam last year, bankers were gathering for an innovation meeting, and we were presented with a slide. The slide was, everybody was uh, not interested in the topic, and then there was a slide with a, a, a dentist with a mask on his face and a sitting in his hand. And the picture, without nothing else, was taken from the patient perspective. And it was a banker's meeting. Everybody start laughing. Then the speaker asked uh, all of the people in the, in the room, um, try to ask yourself, how many youngsters in Europe do prefer to go to a bank than rather going to a dentist? Everybody stopped laughing. 68% youngsters do prefer to go to the dentist than to a bank. That's where trust, that's why we need to work on trust and to make sure that there is a new connection between youngsters, millennials, and what do the community of business and the community of investors do. Otherwise, this is going to be a sort of tough game for everybody. Mm -hmm. So, okay. well, <clears throat> I can give an example on trying to connect to the millennials. Um, and it's not from Kelmore, that's from Quinana in Australia. And um, that's a sister organization, you could say. Um, they are all also working with uh, symbiosis, but they call it synergies. Then they have a, a payoff uh, uh, for the organization that says working with the communities. And they are actually also working on, they have a big problem because soon there won't be enough uh, people in their area to, to they, they, they would lose employees because the, the, new, the, the, the small generations are coming, the, 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 the big gen generation are uh, retiring soon. And that's a main issue. So they have to, to gain the trust, that they have to work together. And for that, there's a connection between the industry uh, and the new generation. And they work with uh, some uh, very good uh, skills program where they uh, uh, tr uh, get the young uh, people to, to see the possibilities in their own area and their own possibilities to have a career and in, 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 the in, the, in the companies. So I think it's, it's a challenge also the, the companies has to take on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so trust and transparency are, are two words that, that came back in, in a few of the answers of Max. I hear them uh, being called out by, by Pierre, and, and, and I, I heard you mention them as well. So uh, maybe this is a good opportunity to try and, and, and uh, well, get into this uh, topic of trust and transparency uh, more in depth related to this topic, and maybe see uh, who has an, an example of uh, their organization uh, or let's say within their ecosystem where a company is really actively working on increasing transparency and establishing trust not only with their customers but also in their supply chain to really work towards these continuous uh, flows of, of products, materials, 
but also social uh, systems. Who'd like to kick off? Uh, I can give an example. So um, there's a, a company in the UK called Orange Box. They make office furniture. Um, we heard about Herman Miller chair today, and Orange Box have quite quite a similar profile in terms of being quite design-led um, and have done a number of programs over the last few years uh, to look at reducing the number of materials in their chair, make them ready for remanufacture and, and so on. Um, they just recently entered into a partnership with a, a London-based SME called Premier Sustain, who are a furniture remanufacturing organization. And um, Premier are really interesting in, in how their business model works because they generally work for uh, large corporates and remanufacture their furniture without ever taking ownership of it. So they, they sort of bundle it in as part of a office services management type program. So the reason I'm sharing this example is because if you speak to either of those two companies, they've entered into a, a commercial relationship which they will both admit they don't know where it's going but they have worked with each other long enough to build up enough trust to say, we know this is the direction of travel that we have to go down. Uh, Orange Box know that their chairs can be manufactured. They've been designed to be manufactured. They are being remanufactured by third parties, but Orange Box aren't capturing any of that value. Their customers are beginning to ask, what happens to this at end of life? Will you take it back? They don't know if it's gonna cannibalize their, their existing market share. They don't know how their customers, their existing customers will feel. They don't know who their new customers are going to be. Um, but they've decided to take that step by finding a furniture remanufacturer that they trust, entering into a contract that says any orange box chair can be taken back and given to Premier and Premier will remanufacture it. And it'll be really interesting to see where that develops. And um, I really kind of enjoy their honesty and you, you said transparency they're being transparent about the mm -hmm. fact that they're experimenting they don't know where it will end up but but they are entering into that trust yeah. and, and and hopefully to kind of build in the inclusive part um, remanufacturing is, is jobs heavy so this should be uh, a way to create jobs locally you, you, know, you don't want to be transporting a lorry load of chairs halfway across the country it doesn't really pack very neatly into a lorry so so local jobs should hopefully form a part of this story. I think two interesting examples from the US, uh, New York based, are Ecovative, which was mentioned by an earlier speaker, which is mushroom derived packaging materials. And that's a company that was able to scale by expanding into building construction materials. They determined that their, that their materials had the rigor to be able to transition into that new application. And so that's for us a remarkable success story of being able to scale it th across multiple sectors in terms of the application of a product. Um, the second example is Eileen Fisher, the clothing company that has a supply chain transparency as a goal um, and also has introduced a new model where customers can return their clothes to the store. They'll be refurbished and sold in an adjacent used Eileen Fisher clothing store. And so they determined that there was still a market value in selling refurbished products of their own that in theory could compete with a much higher price point of a new apparel um, in their original clothing store. So it's interesting to see that when you're not operating out of fear of deviating from traditional commerce models, that there is profit to be made in those non-traditional models. Leadership. You want to add anything, Max? Quickly, just I think uh, uh, Park 2020, uh, a, a real estate uh, uh, development in the Netherlands, developed by Delta Development. I think it's a, a close uh, proxy of what you've been uh, you have been uh, asking and describing. They have been, of course, engaging other companies in the lighting uh, industry, in the carpeting industry, and more importantly, from my standpoint, is. There is a, a, a program for, for, for this uh, real estate uh, establishment to engage the local community in working in the garden they've been uh, developing and trying to include uh, disadvantaged people working with them in the community there. It is uh, a real estate project uh, coming on stream 
but with the connection, social innovation flourishing around, I believe it's something that uh, uh, personally I do uh, praise as a, a, an example of social innovation inclusion. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? Because I'm through the questions on the app. So this is the time to stand up and participate. You want to ask a question? No. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, there's a microphone right behind you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, the topic here is about the inclusive economy. And we have understood and we heard that, that the circular economy can regenerate relationships between uh, entrepreneurs, between uh, business and so on. But there is also another kind of uh, inclusive economy that is a social, solidaristic, uh, cooperative economy. In your opinion or in your experience, which is the relationships, which are the relationships between uh, the circular economy that regards uh, entrepreneurs and the cooperative, social, solidaristic economy that regards people? Maybe. To, uh, to, to kick off, it's, I think that's a, that's a good and a very interesting uh, question because I think if you talk about the collaborative uh, economy, then the interaction, so the collaboration between people is, is key. Um, if you look at the circular uh, economy, then collaboration is also key, but it's not the only goal because the goal related to the circular economy is also uh, related to what type of materials do I want to use? Uh, you want to use safe materials, pure uh, materials, want to have clean production uh, processes, fair labor uh, conditions, etc. So I'd say collaboration is a very important aspect of uh, the circular economy and in fact I believe that you cannot strive towards circularity without collaborating because well, it, A, it doesn't make any sense, and B, you can't get a circular product without working together with both your uh, customers and your suppliers. So I'd say that, that, that that's a first uh, answer. Does anyone want to build on that or add to that or have a different opinion? I totally support, and my uh, personal take on this is, uh, again, uh, of course, uh, uh, cooperative economy is the way uh, we look at how actors do work within the economy. Circular economy, I would say, has a sort of very high ambition, which is that of decoupling growth from the use of natural resources, which I think as a sort of bold kind of ambition which cannot, of course, be achieved without cooperation, but is one step uh, ahead, I believe, in trying to create the conditions for being uh, um, um, naturally regenerative uh, no, uh, by design of the natural capital and uh, be able to create values, uh, uh, value and jobs. So, of course, they are pretty related, but to be circular, I think, it's one step ahead, even for the cooperative economy, in a new framework of growth, which could represent one of the best answers to the crisis where the linear model brought all us today. I would just add briefly that that, that sort of collective enterprise, community-based enterprise that you mentioned is, offers a challenge to a corporate structure. And I think that, that any alternative business model that challenges the corporate structures that led to us being in the situation that we are today in terms of climate change and um, inequalities of, of power is a good thing. And so, whereas even though that many aspects of the sharing economy are disruptive in terms of labor issues and established collective labor agreements, um, there are some, some very complex issues to be worked through. In general, these alternative economies like the circular economy, the peer-to-peer -peer economy, and the idea of a, of a collective um, ecosystem, community-based alternative to a corporate structure are all good in terms of advancing an agenda of having more empowerment to individuals and entrepreneurs who then do not have to conform to a corporate model that has not always served us very well. Thank you. Okay, if there are no uh, last questions, then um, I think this is a, a good uh, 
moment to wrap up and thank my co-panelists for their uh, contributions um, and end the day. Thank you all. Thanks.